Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I have to start this in the confessional, the uh, a, a, a concept all of you are familiar with, or at least were at some time. Uh, I'm a longtime recovering Democrat. <laughs> Back in the summer of 1960, I did some campaigning for Jack Kennedy, uh, which was not uh, unusual for an Irish Catholic lad of the time. Uh, in the summer of 61, I sat on a bar stool at the old Quebec Gardens in Cincinnati uh, next to John J. Jack Gilligan, who was uh, running for re-election as a Cincinnati City Councilman. Uh, Jack, of course, uh, is a Notre Dame man. He went on to become a U.S. Congressman, uh, Governor of Ohio, and lost that seat when he uh, instituted uh, an income tax in Ohio, which was very unpopular. Uh, now, when I started practicing law, though, uh, I realized the impact of Jack's tax and spend philosophy. And so I, I converted to conservatism, much to the delight of my dear old Irish dad, and uh, uh, have lived happily ever after on that side of the political fence. Uh, now, Jack uh, has a daughter, Kathleen, and uh, Kathleen went on to become the governor of Kansas, and she and Jack are uh, reportedly the only uh, father-daughter duo ever to have been governors of, uh, of, of their states. Um, Kathleen, unfortunately, did not suffer the same metamorphosis that I did. Kathleen is now, as you may know, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, the head of Health and Human Services. And uh, Kathleen is the lead defendant in the Notre Dame lawsuit to declare unconstitutional the mandate that uh, requires health insurance coverage for contraceptives, sterilization, and abortion producing drugs, plus related education and counseling for the same which I'm going to shortcut through the rest of these comments by calling it the objectionable coverage. Now, this is not a battle over whether the deprivation of free contraceptive pills deprives poor little Polly of the satisfaction of all her earthly desires. Uh, this is rather a battle over religious freedom. It's the most egregious attack on our First Amendment free exercise of of religion rights uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, as Bill noted, to its credit, Notre Dame did file a lawsuit challenging the mandate, and uh, uh, it challenged it on the basis of the violation of the First Amendment, also on the basis of the violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The, uh, the suit was dismissed as premature uh, in December, uh, and that was before the government, the HHS, came out with the revised mandate, which is what we'll be talking about here. Uh, it's on appeal to the Seventh Circuit, and, uh, and uh, that presumably will move forward as time goes on. Notre Dame was not the only institution to uh, file suit. Over 60 uh, uh, nonprofit and for-profit institutions have filed suit. About half in the nonprofit category, Catholic universities, hospitals, dioceses, et cetera, uh, and about half in the for-profit private business arena. Uh, Hobby Lobby is probably the most well-publicized of the for-profit cases, and I understand that the uh, owners are not Catholic, but they do firmly believe uh, in um, on religious grounds that the mandate is uh, entirely inappropriate. That case was just recently argued in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it appears that the for-profit cases are going to be getting to the Supreme Court before the nonprofit cases because there's nothing in uh, the mandate that uh, provides any protection to for-profit businesses. <clears throat> whereas we'll get into some of the things that uh, the government has talked about with respect to nonprofits. 
Now, I said there's a, it's a revised mandate. It came out <coughs> earlier this year, and there's been commentary on it. The comment period has ended. Uh, several things about the revised mandate. It does provide an exemption called the church exemption <coughs> for churches, uh, church associations, and seminaries to the extent of their religious activities. Uh, beyond that, though, beyond the church exemption, you have really two categories of, uh, of, uh, of institutions. You have those that, ha that have insured plans, like Notre Dame's for students. Uh, for insured plans, it provides an accommodation. These are for religious organizations that hold themselves out as religious organizations and that object to the mandate uh, on religious grounds. Um, the new mandate, the, re the revised mandate, requires insurers of insured plans to provide the objectionable coverage, that is the insurers like Aetna, which provides the Notre Dame plan for students, that's the insurer. It must provide the objectionable coverage by separate policies uh, to the policy holders, the people who are covered by uh, the general in health insurance provisions. So this is supposed to be done, and I say, and I'll get back to this in a few minutes, uh, at no cost to or involvement by the religious institution. So the religious institution provides a health insurance plan, not including the objectionable coverage, the insurer then is supposed to provide individual policies for the objectionable coverage at no cost to or involvement by uh, the uh, religious organization. <clears throat> the other category is self-insured plans. And to abbreviate this, uh, the pages of this in the, in the mandate regulation, but the government, the HHS, provides certain proposals none of which guarantee that the religious institution will not have to provide and pay for the objectionable coverage. So self-insured plans uh, are far worse off even than the insured plan situation, which at least provides something in the accommodation that can be debated. All right, what are the reactions uh, to the revised mandate? Well, criticism by and large, and a good deal of criticism on, uh, that there's no exemption for businesses, for, for the for-profit enterprises. Um, as Notre Dame emphasized in its complaint, uh, the mandate violates church teachings, and Notre Dame did go into great detail in its complaint explaining the church's position on contraception, sterilization, and abortion. Uh, so there's no need in this audience for me to go into any depth about what that means because we all generally know what, what the church's position is on these subjects. On the moral side, the ethicists, and there are quite a number have written on this subject, uh, apparently from what I've seen, all agree that the mandate is an unjust law uh, which should not be obeyed. And uh, that is a position that the bishops, of course, have taken and, and very strongly. Now, when it comes to cooperation with the mandate by religious institutions, the ethicists are all over the lot. I'd like to analogize it to a lawyer who wants to find expert testimony. You can find expert testimony on, uh, on virtually any subject, on any side of any subject, uh, a thing which frustrates judges uh, a great deal, of course. Um, but on this subject, we have, and I'm just going to give the range. We have ethicists who say that even the accommodation is immoral uh, because the insurers will bury the cost of the objectionable coverage in the religious organization's premium. So it's something that cannot be, uh, cannot be cooperated with because, it's, uh, because you wind up paying for the objectionable coverage and therefore it's immoral. Okay. The opposite extreme is that even providing and paying the premiums for the objectionable coverage is not immoral, not uh, culpable material cooperation and evil, because of the duress, and that duress is the federal government's uh, threat to impose very substantial fines on the organization that has a health insurance plan but doesn't include the objectionable coverage. So there are ethicists saying that the duress rules the day, and as a result of that, uh, it's not immoral to uh, provide the coverage. 
All right. Uh, so that doesn't lead you very far, except to, if you're looking for an out in some respect, you can find an ethicist that will uh, provide whatever rationale you're looking for. Now, what are the alternatives available to nonprofit religious organizations? And, and I'm going to focus on Notre Dame. It can follow the bishop's lead, disobey the mandate as an unjust law, and continue to litigate, uh, hoping for a preliminary injunction during the pendency of the case to uh, protect it against enforcement by the government of the penalties, et cetera, uh, under the mandate. That's one alternative. Another if, uh, for insured plans is to accept the accommodation but face the problem of the varied costs, and there are some people who doubt that you can ever know whether the insurance company is including or not including uh, the, the, uh, the cost of the objectionable coverage in the premium payable by the religious organization. Third, you could, uh, I suppose, drop the insured plans, and uh, that would avoid your providing the coverage or taking the accommodation. On the self-insured side, um, this is really tough. Uh, one discussed alternative is uh, to provide the coverage, but to work with your employees to try to discourage them uh, from using that coverage, perhaps by some kind of financial inducement, uh, uh, perhaps by training and education and church doctrine. Um, and finally, uh, with respect to self-insured plans, uh, uh, there is potential for considering the shifting of those plans to insured plans, but then you're back into the accommodation dilemma and whether you're actually going to wind up paying for the objectionable coverage. So those are the alternatives, and uh, the question um, becomes, what choice will Notre Dame make? Well, we did ask Notre Dame what avenue it intends to pursue, and the spokesman, uh, Dennis Brown, uh, uh, who just cropped up the other day as the spokesman on uh, the comments made by uh, Gordon Gee, uh, president of the Ohio State University in our home state of Ohio. Uh, I, that, I could talk about that, but anyway. Uh, Brown said to us in response to our question that Notre Dame is engaged in confidential conversations, uh, but he did not indicate with whom. So we can speculate, uh, are they sitting around tables uh, in the administration building engaging in confidential conversations, or are they indeed sitting down with HHS and maybe uh, in collaboration with the bishops or others and discussing res a resolution of the problem? Um, I'm, I'm rather hopeful that it's the latter and that there indeed are meaningful negotiations taking place, but we don't know. So let me conclude by saying that uh, let us pray that Our Lady's University will continue to seek a course that is truly morally acceptable and in accord with church teachings, that bears witness to the faith and leaves no taint of scandal. The spotlight will be on Notre Dame in, in this controversy. There is no question about that. And uh, so may the fighting Irish battle in court or in negotiations for a resolution that we can be proud of. Um.